G'day punters, welcome along to our very, very first edition of Behind the Boxes. I'm going to be joined by one of my good mates and a man I respect enormously as far as his judgment in greyhound racing is concerned. Timmy Newbold, the battle is going to join me every week here on Behind the Boxes. We're basically going to chew the fat about greyhound racing in New South Wales. We'll discuss the pertinent issues. We'll try and find you a winner. Easier said than done. We'll have some great interviews as well. Timmy Newbold, the battle, welcome along. Welcome to Behind the Boxes. I've got to ask you first up, mate, are you missing race corn? G'day, Duke. Lovely to be on the show. Uh, at this stage of the game, no, I'm not. It's been about, what, six weeks until uh, since I hung up the binoculars. Uh, we didn't quite get that final meeting, June 26th at Whitworth Park, uh, when COVID hit. But, yeah, at this stage, no, I'm not missing the calling. It might come to a stage, oh, maybe when these big races come around, I, I might do a bit of a 12th man and go up and barricade myself with a broadcast box and, and lock Matty Jackson out. And But, no, I'm well, just geeing up. But, no, I... I'm, I'm really enjoying the new role at Greyhound Racing New South Wales. It's across club operations with a little bit of racing and media thrown in. So, yeah, and on Duke, I can assure you, I'm not missing those late nights getting home from Dapno around 1am in the morning, that's for sure. And, of course, you miss your other vocation with COVID. You've become headmaster new ball. You've got a couple of young kids. How are you coping with, <laughs> with, with homeschooling? I'm lucky, mate. My kids are, you know, way, way past that. How, how are you doing it? Oh, we're struggling. It's a struggle. <laughs> a six and a half year old. I'll tell you what, I have a, you, you, you take your hat off to teachers. Uh, my oldest is six and a half. He's in kindy at the moment. And geez, they've got a lot more patience than what I have. That's for sure. But we're struggling through on the two and a half year old. Well, he, oh, he's a destructive little fella at the moment. So yeah, our hands are full at the moment, but we're, we're struggling through just like everyone is at the moment here, Duke. So in Sydney, so uh, look, it is what it is, and we'll just continue to punch our way through. I've got a couple of tips for you for different subjects. Media and communication, Sky Racing 1 and 2. Uh, mathematics, teach them about <laughs> fractions, how many what percentage we've got in a race. Mate, it's quite easy. I don't know what you blokes are whinging about, seriously. But anyway, <laughs> Timmy, great to have you on board. As I said, you will be joining me each and every week. Our very special guest here on the first edition of Behind the Boxes is the CEO of Greyhound Racing New South Wales, Tony Mestroff, talk about a man under pressure. Tony, welcome along to the show. I've got to ask you first up, how difficult a decision was it for you and your team to have to pull the pin on the 2021 Million Dollar Chase Series? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Duke. Um, it was really disappointing. We've built the event up over the last two years. It's the world's richest Greyhound event. There was over a million people that watched it last year. So, um, not to have that is disappointing. And I'm disappointed for the participants and the opportunity um, they have. They set for the race. There's a real opportunity for someone to be a millionaire. But the good thing is we've postponed it to next year um, and someone will have the opportunity to win a million dollars. And Tony, obviously the safety of participants, it was paramount in making the decision. Yeah, safety of our participants is, is absolutely paramount, Tim. And I think from our point of view, that was the most important thing. Um, if we can provide safety for our participants, there is a little bit of travelling um, with the million dollar chase and that was a concern for us. So that was a major concern and another reason we postponed it. So you, you, we put the series back a week, we bought some time. Um, I know you, you looked at every different scenario, running two $500,000 races, a yeah. scenario of running 10 $100,000 races, but I guess the nail in the coffin was that Hunter lockdown last week. Tell me what was going on behind closed doors as you were trying to, you know, making every, you know, attempt to get the series up and running. What was going on at Greyhound Racing New South Wales? Uh, obviously, the racing team's been working incredibly well, um, working overtime. The COO, Wayne Billet, he heads up the racing team. Wayne and I speak 10 to 15 times a day, and we endeavoured to run the million dollar chase. In fact, I said to Wayne, we must run it. And I think um, really, the really disappointing thing was the Hunter, um, the Hunter lockdown. I think that was the, the last straw. We really couldn't run it. A lot of our participants come from that region. And I think once the Hunter went into lockdown, we were going to co compromise the event. And we spent the whole of the last three years in building it up. Um, we've really captured the hearts of the participants around Australia and punters. So I think 
we, with that said, we uh, were best not going ahead and we just couldn't. I think it was, I mean, there's people dying around the state every day. I don't think it's appropriate for us to promote a race. I get, we give the participants another opportunity to win the prize money, but it was just inappropriate. And I think um, best for another time. And Tony, you just didn't want to run the race for the sake of it. After, as you've just alluded to, you've built it up to be a magnificent race, a real success story of the industry. And, and it's a, a million, one million dollar to the winner race. It's been built up as, as that and the world's richest race. So by compromising it, it, it would, to me, would be a, a backward step. No, it would have been a backward step. That's what we spoke about. Um, and particularly we did a TV deal as well and the, we couldn't take advantage of the, the publicity on TV either because they were limited through COVID. So everywhere we looked at, um, it wasn't fair. But if you looked at positive to next year, I mean, April, you've got the golden Easter egg. Then you've got $2 million chases in the space of four months. I mean, if someone's got a dog that's hot around <laughs> April, I mean, you're going you're gonna to be a millionaire, that's for sure. And that's the, that's the silver lining to it. We know how disappointing it is not to have the race this year. Yeah. But next year, there's not one $1 million race. There's two $1 million yeah. races. And I know we've got other races, big races in the pipeline that we can't talk about at the moment. But surely that is a silver lining to, to what is a terrible situation. It is a, 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 it is a terrible situation, but it is the silver lining. And to add to that... I went on um, Sky Radio the other day and I said, we have a new concept as well that we want to put into the market and that will probably be scheduled in about March. So you've got March, April, May, September, a chance to win an incredible amount of prize money and it's exciting. And we've obviously done another TV deal and we'll be able to announce that over the next six months. So, and the same with the new concept. So it's just exciting. I, I can't wait. We're going to saturate and own that period and the participants will be the winners, which is, which is what it's all about. I think it's an ideal time for any big syndications to look at getting into Greyhound Racing with that prize money available next year for that period, just that small period. It will be you know, a, a great, great idea for even some of the thoroughbred uh, syndications to look at coming oh. over to Greyhound Racing because that prize money is there to be won and it is big, yeah. big money. I agree with that. And, and a lot of the owners and the trainers have said to me that people are looking to get into Greyhound Racing through the million dollar chase. We met with the, the top trainers last week around a whole lot of things around prize money and grading and other things. And they said the million dollar chase has given them owners, new owners and new people to the game. So that's the idea that the wagering was amazing. I mean, from their first year, we had the wagering was three and a half million to last year a record, a world record of 9.3 million um, for the Tab Million Dollar Chase. It was just a resounding success. So uh, we want to build on it. We, we, want, to, we want to get 10,000 people in Wentworth Park when conditions allow. And I think it can get bigger and bigger and bigger. And now you've seen the Western Australians, the South Australians um, and other states embracing it. Tasmanian dog won it last year. I mean, this is what it's all about. It's a, it, it is a national um, pride um, to run it every year. Tony, I just want to talk about, about the pandemic as it is. And I, as I said, we, mm. it's, it is shocking. There are people dying. There are so, yeah. you know, New South Wales, are, you know, 350, 400 cases at the moment. We see small businesses going to the wall every day and the mental health issues that are associated with that are, you know, they're enormous. And they'll, they'll be with us for many years to come. Can you tell us some of the lengths that GRNSW and the, some of the hoops you've had to jump through to continue racing because to me out of everything of this um i just i think it's an amazing thing that we are still racing not only are we racing we, we actually are programming more races um for instance you know wentworth park traditionally would race four times a month on a wednesday night correct we've got 22 meetings this month trying to spread that love and spread that money around the state 22 meetings with wednesday wentworth park prize money we've got nine meetings in the month with Saturday City prize money. Tell us what you've had to go through and, and, and how is it that we are still actually racing? Yeah, it's amazing. I, I, I tell you, this is the most resilient industry of any industry, any industry I know. I mean, you look back at the closure five years ago, we just find a way. And that's the mantra of the staff. As I said, Wayne Billet and the racing team have done an amazing job, which Tim is a part of now. And... Um, we just need to keep going. And every day it changes. Our, our day starts 
um, with the 11 o'clock Gladys meeting. Um, and then we go from there. We see what's been locked down and what's not locked down. What are the hot spots? And we just work from there. And every day we need to be agile. I think that's part of it. We've been agile. We've been quick to make decisions. The buck stops with me. Um, it's the pressure I live with. And you've got to make the right decision. And I think we've all made the right decisions. I think that's the first part of it. And I think participants have paid their um played their part, Mark. They've really stuck to all of the regulations, the health orders, and they've played their part in every way. And I just, I'm going to send out a note this week to participants to encourage them to get the jab. And I know everyone's got their, their own views on it. Um, and I want people to keep their own views. All I'm saying is I've now double jabbed. I know you have as well, Jude. I encourage them to get out and get the jab, protect your family, protect the industry. Everyone needs the industry. We're here because of the industry. Let's protect it. Um, we're doing it every day, what we can do and our part. I'm sure both of you are as well. So get out there and get the jab. And um, if it goes every day, Mark, we just got to make the right decision. Tone, I think the thing is that moving forward, not that we want to be indoctrinated or that we want to live yeah. in a society where they keep tabs on us, but I think in the future, it's, it's quite clear. If you want to go to a, a footy match, if you want to go to a concert, if you want to go to any of that, you're not going to get in there unless you've had two jabs, right? And and I just think it's amazing that, you know, we're, we're now talking 18 or 20 months that we've been living with this COVID thing. I think we've lost four or five meetings in that oh, 18 months. It's yeah. just, it, it's unbelievable. unbelievable. And you, you know what, it's so, the participants have been so diligent. If they think there's someone that shouldn't be at a racetrack from a different zone, they're ringing both Wayne and myself because they care and they want the industry to keep going. We have to play our part where we have to make some tough decisions that participants mightn't agree with. But we, we have to make those decisions. So in the future, we don't know what it looks like. But the one thing is there'll be a lot of limitations for people that don't get jabs. Um, and, and I've had participants like in any part of society ringing me saying, I don't agree with the jab. That's fair enough. But you've got to still protect yourself and the family and the industry, and we have to do the right thing as an industry to protect the other participants that get the jab. So it's a it's a really topical subject. I've read a lot in the papers about it. Legally, it's happening throughout the world. So it's quite interesting, but all we can do is encourage people in our industry to protect their living and their family by getting the jab. We've seen wagering in the past 12 or 18 months. And I guess, you know, you go back to that great quote of, of Kerry Packer that everyone needs an Alan Bond in their life. Right, but if you look at if you look at where we were eighteen months ago, uh, if you look at where we are now today, in in regards to wagering, as I said, we had a million dollar chase night, nearly ten million dollars turned over on the night. I remember probably fifteen or twenty years ago, if we did a million dollars on a meeting at Wentworth Park on a Saturday night, everyone was jumping up and down. It, like a million dollars now, we none of our meetings do that. We always we're doing in excess of that. Some pundits are going to say. It's a vote of confidence in the product that we, we yep. present. Other people are going to say it's due to COVID. I'd like to think it's probably a combination of both. Yeah, I, look, look, there is a part of where people are at home and they are punting more. I, I, I get that fact. But I think there's been some definitive changes from our point of view. I think we've worked incredibly hard on our welfare. I think we've got Tim Kay, who has come on board and led the way around treating dogs well. You know, he's... Um, He's even got the dog himself. We've seen Jess Fox in the Olympics. She's got pink, a greyhound. And I think we're doing the right thing by the dog being both the participants and greyhound racing New South Wales. I think we've given people a reason to accept the industry and to punt on the industry. I think that's helped. And I think it's helped a lot. And also um, the product is a very good product. I think everything we've done from a digital point of view um, through the Tad Million Dollar Chase and other initiatives has helped our product. Look, one major wagering company has said we're the fastest growing product in Australia. That includes all jurisdictions, sport, other racing and so on. We must be doing something right and something different. But I think it's that welfare initiative through the GAP program that we're pushing. And I think once again, participants have played their part. There's been no major incidents that Gwix had to um, deliver or, or punishment. So I think all in all, that's why we're a leading product. And I think the way we've marketed ourselves around our major events has helped. Um, that's really protected that wagering as well. And Tony, that wagering has provided additional funding for the industry. Oh. 
We're seeing track upgrades uh, at Casino. Lighting is going in at Casino. Uh, there's plans for a new track at Goulburn. Uh, are all of the tracks around New South Wales going to be upgraded to meet the minimum uh, standards here in here in New South Wales? Yeah, they have to be, Tim. So every track has to meet the minimum track standard. We've got a certain time to meet that. So virtually every track will get upgraded. Um, we de do need to use the extra money from our funding ourselves. The government obviously gives us $30 million to meet that minimum standard. But you need to keep up with the ongoing maintenance. And we do that from our wagering um, the wagering um, um, outcome. So, I mean, last financial year, we turned over $2.5 billion. I mean, that's huge. That's, you know, we're going up by seven or 800 billion every year. I'm um, sorry, seven or 800 um, million every year. I mean, when I started uh, back four years ago, it was 1.4 billion. I mean, we're a, we're a growing product, but we want to put that back into industry. We're not here to, to grow big reserves in the bank. There's no use. Um, we need to put that back into prize money and tracks and also facilities, which, you know, in some sense, they need some improvement um, to get people to the track. So I think it's really important in our clubs that we reinvest the money um, back in our tracks and we're going to do that. And we've seen Grafton, we've seen the results of putting money into tracks and the, the outcomes for participants. I was going to bring up Grafton because when we talk about tracks and track rebuilds, Grafton is obviously front and centre. David Aldred and his team uh, did a terrific job there. We spent, you know, around five or six million dollars. Yeah. I know neither of you guys have been there. I'm lucky. I've been there eight or ten times. It is, wow. it is to me. It, it's it's one of the best tracks I've ever seen in Australia, and I've seen <laughs> I've seen a lot of them. But I guess Tony, it must be gratifying to hear the comments from trainers both big and small you take the likes of like a Jason McKay who who I I, I know he, he he loves the track and and I guess yeah. when we look at where Grafton was 18 months ago the old track uh it had served its purpose it, it actually became dangerous hence why you you yeah, made yeah. that decision to do the real rebuild yeah. but surely you've got to get a lot of satisfaction out of you know coming from where we were at Grafton to where we are today I'm so proud. I'm so happy for the club. You know John Corrigan. He's been there a long time. Um, he virtually drove me mad <laughs> to, uh -huh. to do a full reno. And, and we, w the point was that we couldn't um, do a renovation to, to fix that back turn. So it ended up being a, a full renovation, not, not just a, a repair um, to the track. So the outcomes have been amazing. The feedback has been amazing. The way it's run, the low injury rate, is a testament to David Aldred and the team. David heads up our track infrastructure. Um, it was on time, it was on budget, and it is a standard for Greyhound Racing New South Wales. I dare say it's the best track in Australia. It really is. And the low injury rate is where we need to be. And I think that has changed our thought process for the other tracks in the state of what are we going to do. And I'm saying we're going to go down and we're going to change our track structure tomorrow but we really need to look at those new rebuilds and say, hey, how can we replicate Grafton? Um, it's just phenomenal. It's fair. It's safe. Participants want to be there. Tony, in my time, 25 years in the industry, I'm sure Duke will agree. I don't think I've ever come across anything which has been praised as much as what Grafton oh. has. It is universal praise. And that is hard to come about in any any facet of life, but oh. the, 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 the praise has been quite remarkable for Grafton. It, it has been, and, and obviously the club are, are keen to try and fix the facility and bring that up to standard. So we're working with them around the grandstand or whatever in the future. And it's a shame we couldn't have that opening day. And we were going to invite quite a number of the, our friends of, of parliamentary friends of Greyhounds to an opening event, but I'm sure we'll get to a ribbon cutting in that area. But um, it is it set the standard, um, definitely. Not one complaint. First time in history. <laughs> time. Not one. Time. I, don't want to, I, don't want, I don't want to know participants. You know, they, they were all, all being positive and rightly so. It's, um, it's a great outcome. We've got to work out how we replicate that. We've got some exciting new announcements coming um, soon around tracks um, and some exciting upgrades for participants. So stand by for them. Tony, just getting on to rehoming, hearing figures uh, coming through that they're going to be record rehoming figures mm. this year. And th that's after breaking the record last year. Correct. Yeah, correct, um, Tim. It's, it's been an amazing, considering COVID, 
And a lot of the time, like now, Gap, um, they're basically um, rehoming dogs online. <laughs> We've got a, a really big initiative around the 14-day foster, and that's worked incredibly well. So they've done an amazing job, Alicia Fuller and the team. They've just, and you know, now we're looking at a new facility as well at Londonry, which will even help further. But the numbers this year, we're just going through and auditing those numbers, but it looks like we're just going to be short of 2,000, which is nearly a 600 uplift on last year, which is just amazing. And um, I'm sure everyone's the same. They see a dog in every corner of Sydney. Um, they're, they're very popular, they're a beautiful animal. Um, and we, we just keep getting bigger and bigger each year. Um, and they're popular, um, and rightly so, they're just beautiful. They're, they're easy to look after, and usually people are coming back that have had one, they want two. So the team, I can't tell you how hard it's been for them. Uh, they've done an amazing job. And some Olympic success along the way with her, Jess Fox. We know she fosters a greyhound by the name of Pink. So everyone in greyhound racing, oh, well, everyone in the country was cheering along Jess, but us here at Gre in greyhound racing, we're well, giving her a, a little bit of an extra cheer. Oh, she was. She's worked with um, our GAP program for a number of years now. She's an unofficial kind of ambassador. Um, Richard Fox, you notice, know, commentated. He, I think he stayed home to look after the dog. <laughs> he was <laughs> under orders. Um, but, like, he acknowledged the GAP team. He's worked closely with the GAP team himself, with Jess. So it was just nice to see her win and the passion she had for the dog. And the dog did play a part in her winning the gold. So I thought from a sport perspective, it was one of the, the gutsiest efforts you've ever seen, particularly her face when she clearly had a gold medal around her neck um, after the first event, the slalom. So um, I was proud of her, but look, you know, we're looking to work with her more in the future around, um, around our GAP program and promote it. We've got a, another person we want to announce to help us with a GAP program over the next couple of months as well, who's a high profile sports person. Tony, it wasn't that long ago that our industry was literally at loggerheads with the coalition government in New South Wales. We, we go back five years ago and, and the anniversary of that five year in it, announcement of the ban actually fell on Grafton Cup night. Um, yeah. That relationship seems to have improved dramatically in, <laughs> in the last few years. It was a, it's an amazing turnaround. As I said, the five years ago to now, we had 27 in our parliamentary friends of Graham that turned up the first day. That was apparently a record. And it just shows how far we've gone. They were passionate about the Greyhound. Nat Smith, he um, is really passionate around the Greyhounds. Um, so he's leading the way. Um, he wants to do more. We're in contact all the time. We've got full access to that group. But even John Barillaro, the Deputy Premier, um, and Don Perito, the Treasurer, they're highly supportive of the industry and I'm in regular contact with them. So it's a really good feel, um, you know, and the... the can't not mention the minister, Kevin Anderson. Kevin's been a fantastic supporter, um, obviously through COVID, but through regular contact about what we're doing. He's very proud of what the industry's done. We're a regional industry. Um, we're so important for the regional economies. We provide 509 million of economic benefits to New South Wales, which no one probably knows about. So to the politicians, we're an important part of that. So I think What's done has been done from a closure point of view. They realise, like everyone, that was a mistake. It was a ridiculous decision. And we're all moving on. I feel like um, there's just such a good feel and relationship with them. And we've got full access to whatever politician we need to to, to discuss issues or, or anything else. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's a real turnaround. And I really, um, I suppose I'm proud of that turnaround as well. Um, just the attitude of the politicians and... Um, how willing they are to help us. Tone, it's been four years now since you, you started the gig at, at Greyhound Racing New South Wales as CEO. Obviously, you would never, ever have foreseen the challenges that you've had to face with COVID. Um, can you just tell me, in your own opinion, what, what are some of the big achievements for yourself personally and also uh, for the industry in that, in that four-year reign? Yeah, but thanks for, the, for asking, Mark. Um, I think the first one is the welfare outcomes. I know I touched on it, but I feel like we've got an industry we can be proud of. I know in the past, there was people who did the wrong thing and they're no longer in the industry, but geez, I'm proud of the participants and how we've cared for our dogs and the attitude, the gap. Um, you know, I'm happy and proud to stand up in any, any audience or any, um, you know, any 
um, group of people and say how proud I am from the welfare perspective. And the other one's a million dollar chase. It's really brought people um, and put us on the map. Um, now someone can win a million dollars, you know, over a million people watched it on TV. I mean, that is just such a long way from where we were. And it just puts us in a really good position for the future. We've got a future proofing plan that we, we haven't um, put forward yet, but it will um, give the industry a future for a long, long time. And um, that's something I'm working on internally. Um, not many people know about it, but it will give the industry a future. And I think um, probably the proudest thing is I, I gave the industry a future. Um, personally, I, you know, it's taken a personal toll, but in a, I've learned a lot. Um, and I think uh, we've got an industry to be proud of. Yeah, look, honestly, I think yourself and, uh, you know, everyone throughout your, your team there at Greyhound Racing New South Wales has said, you've got to give a massive rap to Wayne Bill. I, I, I yeah. honestly don't know how he does the gig that he does. <laughs> Um, but again, if you look at where we were five years ago to where we are today, it's mind blowing. Um, so again, congratulations. Listen, mate, we're going to do this podcast and vidcast every single week. I'd love to get you on once a month to be able to answer some of the participants questions, um, you know, and have a chat about how the industry is going. Uh, happy, Mark. I really want to, I think this is a good way to update the participants. Um, I hope they do join you and it's a real way of seeking information and finding out what we are doing and what we're trying to do in the future, Mark. So I'd love to come on. Thanks, Timmy. Thanks, Duke. Duke, Thanks, just, mate. Be Sorry, Duke just before he goes, come on, leave us, leave us with a tip in the NRL, Tony. Come oh. on. Melbourne, yeah, Penrith. All I know in the tipping comp, I'm beating Duke now. So that's no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> He was an aim. Aim of mine. Anyway, I'm beating Duke. Look, I'd love the Eagles to win. Um, I'm a manly slash South supporter. So um, I love Manly to win. I think they're on a roll. Um, I think the other sides, apart from Melbourne, they've, you know, they're, they're petering out a little bit. It's been a long year. Uh, Melbourne at the benchmark, I thought we went well against them last year. So I'm not a very good tipper, but um, I hope Manly win. Momentum. Just up, I've just pulled up the tipping competition that we have at Greyhound Race in New South Wales. Tony's telling Porky Pies. I'm actually in front of him. Anyway, listen, Tony, again, thank you very much uh, for joining us here on our first edition of Behind the Boxes. And as I said, we'll speak to you each and every month. Thanks, James. Keep safe. All right, Tony Mestroff there, CEO of Greyhound Racing New South Wales. We're going to take a quick break here on Behind the Boxes. Timmy and I are going to come back after the break and chew the fat. Welcome back to Behind the Boxes. If you're watching us on the vidcast, I hope it's not too hard of a sight, but if you're listening to us on the podcast, Safe Driving, I'm joined by Timmy, the battler, new bowl. We're going to talk what's hot and what's not at the moment, Timmy. And I've got to tell you, what's hot is Jason McKay. Boy, oh boy, hasn't he been able to find a winner in the last couple of months? Quite remarkable, Duke. Uh, we all know what Jason's capable of. We all know he's one of the best conditioners in the country, one of the best conditioners we've ever seen in the sport. But his run since particularly July 1 is quite remarkable. I went back and had a look at a few stats. He's had 41 starters for 22 winners since July 1. A little over 53% winning strike rate. Now, I don't care what code anywhere in the world there wouldn't be a better strike rate anywhere. 53% winning strike rate over 40 runners. That's in the last little over, what, seven or eight weeks. Um, I should say uh, six weeks. Uh, and overall, uh, it's it's quite a remarkable. We know he, he does get the good cattle. He, he's Marty and Fiona Helena and are, are big supporters of uh, his kennel, but it's quite a remarkable feat. It's a good to win, mate. You know, it's not, I, I know, you know, you see people with 20 dogs, they don't have that success. Um, we talk about his, his litter with uh, Zipping Garth and Zipping Lily and commercial disclosure here, I do look after Zipping Garth's website for them, but that litter with Zipping Maserati winning the, the Grafton Maiden Classic, and then they've, they've gone on and, and, you know, it's again, it's also about taking dogs from other trainers and actually improving them as well. Cool Burbsky went to Grafton, won the Stays Cup, it's come back, it's won three or four races, He's got a flying impress shades, um, you know, stepped it up over the 600 last week on fire. 
you know. He, he sure is. And yeah, Cool Burpsky, I know you're talking through your kick there too, because I know you were on a graft <laughs> and a ten to one or thereabouts. You left me out. Uh, but but even you go back, you know, in the last couple of years, Duke, even uh, in, in 2020, he, he's, his winning strike rate was about 38, 39%. So it's not just a, you know, not only just this year when he's he really struck gold, it's it's been pretty much all the way through his career, throwing obviously group wins uh, here and there, group ones and, and whatnot. But yeah, it is a remarkable remarkable run he's having at the moment. He's not the only one either, Jude. No, look, Mick and Michelle Lill only got a really small team in work, but they just seem to place them so well to me. Like we talk about more source winning the, the Grafton Sprinters Cup, uh, casual glance, um, you know, can run the arms off the clock. It, 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 you know, it's the 388 metre track record at, uh, at Gosford holds that track record there. And there are obviously a number of trainers, you know, who, and I got the utmost respect for them. I know how tough it is. And I, I guess when we talk about trainers like that, we, we need to talk about a guy called Andrew Bell, who only a couple of years ago was still training up at Bogabri, made the move down, uh, has a property, has a, you know, I think 50, 60, maybe 70 dogs in work. This industry needs an Andrew Bell. Uh, and we need him in this industry with the amount of dogs he supplies for the race meeting. Again, notwithstanding that, you look at him, three winners, four winners, five winners, six winners. It, it's, you know, it's so hard to do. And, you know, Jimmy Coleman always said to me, anyone can get a good dog fit. It's a good trainer who keeps a good dog going. Yeah, and on Andrew Bell, I'd like a dollar for every kilometre he travels oh. throughout the week. He, geez, he, he's, he's a workhorse as far as, you know, travelling to all of the various race meetings uh, around New South Wales. And you're right, we need trainers like Andrew with the big numbers going to these, these tracks and doing the travelling to keep... You know, these uh, the as far as wagering is concerned, Duke. You know as well as I do. Whenever you've got an eight dog field, uh, wagering is strong. But you know, if you've only got four or five dogs in a field, the wagering does drop off. And and wagering is how the industry survives in this day and age. So, uh, as you said, the Andrew Bells of this world they're essential for uh, this industry moving forward to, to to supply the dogs at the various tracks. And uh, let's that, that, that's a hell of a lot of work traveling all around this this state. It's a big state and he certainly he, he's getting the rewards because he does deserve it because of all the travel and work he does put in yeah that's the first of my what's hot tell me this to me what is not hot at the moment what is not hot what about the favorites what about the favorites oh, which have gone down in the last week and a half we've got a wagering uh, analyst at greyhound racing new south wales and i've got a little bit of a report here duke uh last uh from sunday through to last saturday at richmond 38% of favourites won. Now, the average price, average winner's price was $5.51. Now, that's massive. Normally, it'd be a lot lower than that. Third so, or fourth in the market, probably. Yeah. So, the, the, the favourite backers have been in all sorts. Now, have a listen to this. The average winner's price at Nara on the Monday, $8.02. Lismore on the Tuesday, $9.72. This is the average winner's price. Now, if you're a favourite backer, Earlier in the week, I'll tell you what, you're drinking, uh, well, you're, you're eating, eating uh, noodles, that's for sure, Duke. And then they got a little bit back later in the week. Uh, Garnada, $2.61. That was uh, the, the average winner's price at that meeting. But all the way through the week, I'll tell you what, they were dead set on their knees, the favourite backers. And uh, look, and I'm sure you and I, we can certainly relate to the <laughs> when you're on the knees oh, yes. the because we've been there many, many times. But the thing is, Timmy, you see I, I, the proliferation of short price favourites now. Every race, it seems, there's a, a $1.20, $1.30, $1.40, $1.50, dollar sixty pop. I remember growing up and working as a, you know, working on a bookmaker stand. And it was rare to have a dog in red figures, you know, unless they're an absolute Monty. It just seems every day of the week, you'll go through the races, there'll be 20 dogs that are, that are odds on. Yeah, you're spot on. And I'll tell you what it does. When you are, you're talking all the skinny prize, skinny favourites, it does encourage people to do uh, play multis. And I'm sure you've been one of those punters in the past. I know I have been. And when you've served up those short price favourites, you play multis. And you know what invariably always happens, Duke? The shortest price one goes down. The $1.20, $1.30 chance gets beaten and you're out of play after a five or six leg up. i tell you what else is hot, Timmy, in New South Wales Greyhound Racing at the moment is track records. Now, don't forget, we're in the middle of winter uh, and Robbie Britton put it 
very succinctly to me a few years ago that track records get broken when it's a humid night, weather's good. So we're talking sort of late spring or late summer and that. But we are smack being in the middle of winter. So we go back, Bandit Ned or Wow broke a track record at Goulburn. Bandit Ned broke a track record at Nara. Wow then broke Bandit Ned's track record. Uh, Line of Quality broke the 600 record at Nara. We had uh, Typhoon Tim broke the 300 record there the other day. Well, I want to talk about Miss Esme. She went to Bathurst over the 618, equal the track record, went to Dubbo, broke the track record, went back to Bathurst on Monday and broke the track record again. An amazing performance, but we've always known she's a chaser with enormous ability. Yeah, she is. And Jack Smith, a, a trainer, he's had big, big raps from day dot on her. And you, we, we saw what she, she's done at Woodworth Park. She's run 29, uh, 60 odd or thereabouts. Uh, she's uh, now stepped up and she's uh, uh, out as a Gatti who has won over the, the 700 metres. She was, she was a really talented bitch. She, I think she might have run 41, 80 odd around Sandown Park. So the big question is, Duke, mm -hmm. we know she's got a big engine for 600 odd metres. Will she go the 700 metres, the 720? Uh, look, you and I have both been in the game for a long, long time. And how many times have you said, oh, she'll, she, it'll, run, it'll make a terrific stay and no doubt in the world and just doesn't run the trip out. Do you think she'll run the 700 metres? I tend to think she will uh, with Zagatti uh, being uh, winning over the 700. I think she will, uh, but uh, the, the, you never know until they're actually put over that journey. It's one of the great unanswered questions in greyhound racing and other forms of racing as well, that a, a greyhound or a horse gives you the impression that it'll, it'll get longer or something. It's the same as a dog stepping up from 400 to 500. You know, there's always that question, will it handle it? And I guess it's harder with, you know, stepping up from 500 to 600 and then 600 to 700. As, again, the thing in her favour is that she's a front-running stayer. So she's not coming from behind and weaving away through a field. She's actually out in front on the arm, getting clear air, and making her own luck out in front. And, and again, they can run that 700 out that way because they're the ones out in front doing it and they're the ones not striking so much trouble. Whereas if they check the fields and have to make two and three runs in a race, it makes it, you know, obviously a bit more difficult for it. But on what, exactly what you said, out of Zagatti, uh, you get the impression, I think, that she'll run it. I think she'll break their hearts when she gets up over that 700 metres. And I love a front-running stayer. Nothing oh, better. Out in front, just keep oh. rolling along. And uh, yeah, I think she will run it. And I love by the time she gets to the 700 metres, she will have, have had a great grounding over the middle journey. So she's not been rushed straight up there. And you don't need to rush... A, a, a greyhound like her up to the 700 when you can when she's she's a you know what i call a, a bunny greyhound straight to the front and keep rolling along you can just knock around winning what how many whatever races over the middle journey and then just step her up in time so you know hopefully you know in the next few months everything does open up and then she will get a chance to to travel all around the country if she does run the 700 meters because we know there's so many races all throughout the the nation and and we do know Jack, he, he's not afraid to travel and oh. loves the trip away, doesn't he? Uh, it's amazing, you know, and, and again, hats off to all Greyhound trainers. As I said, I, I know how tough it is, but you think of the travel they do, they, you think if they're in the last race somewhere, Jack lives at Forbes and, you know, you think when he was going to Wentworth Park, not just once a week, maybe twice a week. So, you know, I know he gets a great hand with Marie. I know she, she does all the work. Jack, Jack's just the front man, right? But, <laughs> but look, she's in great hands with Jack Smith. And we talk about another dog in great hands with Jack Smith, and that is Jungle Juice. Now, on Monday afternoon, we had the New South Wales Sprint Championship at Bathurst. And, and before the race, Timmy, if I had a said to you, let's pick boxes for the two best dogs in this race, <laughs> you would have said, put Jungle Juice in box one and Zulu Warlord in box eight. Now, in the betting, Jungle Juice smashed off the map uh, into $1.20, $1.30. Zulu Warlord blows out the gate, $2.50, $2.70, out to $5.50. Pre-race, how did you see it? And one little fact you, you didn't mention there, they had their ideal boxes, one and eight. But in box two, you had a wide runner on the outside of Jungle <laughs> Juice. So that I can see why the punters were happy to take the skinny quote. Uh, and 
it, 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 it was actually run how you, you you read the race, Ulu Warlord straight to the lead, Jungle Juice driving through to second, third, into the back, and then he was within four down the back straight. Pre-race, I thought he he, he would win the race. I, I wouldn't have been chiming into the dollar twenty or, or, or whatever it, what, what what he was at the end. But I, if, if I was playing any Maldies, he would have been the anchor in the Maldi. That's for sure, Duke. Obviously, Wentworth Park still in hiatus, Battler. Uh... Thursday night at Dabdo, we've got the New South Wales National Sprint Championship and the National Distance Championship. Let's talk about the Sprint Championship first. Every infrared, he's proven to be an iron dog. He's, he just continues to do his best. I know he had no luck the other night. He lines up for start 100 and he's come up with a red. Wouldn't be a fairy tale, uh, uh, the, uh, bringing up the ton, Duke, to, to win uh, the uh, New South Wales Sprint um, down at Dabdo, uh, the the second edition of the race. Uh, it's uh, he, he, you're right. He, he's a magnificent greyhound. He's a he's a reliable beginner. He's got that brilliant speed. He makes his own luck on on the pace, rolling along. And, and he generally, you know, he, he, he's right. But he won the Collison uh, earlier on in the year. Uh, Michael Everin's done a tremendous job with him, and he, he hasn't been afraid to travel around the state, go to different tracks, even interstate at times throughout his career. He's been a, a, a real iron dog, really, when you look at it. And um, yeah, he's drawn box one. Gee, he's going to be hard to beat. There's a lot of speed in the race. Good odds, cash, uh, lightly raced on an upward trend in the three. Fire legend in four. Ebby Jet Power, Ebby uh, Infrared's uh, kennel mate in the five. On the rocks, she's a flying machine. She's got six. And Zibin Kyrgios, he's drawn box eight uh, and will have a vacant box underneath him too because uh, if you're it's not far, she's been an early scratching. So it's an intriguing race, uh, but the way I, I read the race, Ebby Infrared probably leads and it'll just depend where Zibin Kyrgios does get around that first turn, if he can get across and if he's in with, within striking range, he'll be hard to hold out. Gee, I want to be on the pink. I want to be on Kyrgios. As said, he's got the vacant alley inside him, but then he's got on the rocks drawn in box six, who we know is a genuine lead pinger and goes hard left. Mm. Uh, and I, I do vividly remember one night at Wentworth Park, you were calling and zipping Kyrgios, I'm sure he had the pink, and came out underneath the lids. Um, <laughs> I just think it's a race that there could be a stack of trouble inside. And if he can just, as I say, get that, that clear run into the first turn, um, particularly with that vacant box. And Dapto is that sort of a track, as you know, you've pulled hundreds of races there. You know, that first turn, it's crucial, like any of the first turns in a 500. The little issue, issue he might have is Ebby Jet Power running a bit of cover in the drive to the first turn for the kettle made Ebby Infrared because Ebby Jet Power, he runs a straight line. He's a quick beginner, good speed. So if he's running up the middle of the track and zipping Kyrgios, he'll run a straight line as well. Uh, he's got, might have to handle every jet power down the back and he could be held up a, a stride or two, a few lengths. And in the meantime, every infrared, the kennel mate has often gone. I do take your point as in on the rock. She is normally a brilliant beginner and does want to run left, but every jet power, he, he's a, he's a, he's a good size of a dog. He won't give an inch. On the rocks, I think, needs to really make the race for Zipping Kyrgios by crossing um, Ebby Jet Power in that, that that first 20 or 30 metres. If she does do that, I think it's probably Zipping Kyrgios' race. Not the first time we've disagreed on the point. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be the last. $10,000 to the winner of the sprint. $10,000 to the winner of the distance championship. Five runners in the race. It absolutely looks a race in two. Uh, we've got Sound of Silence for Frankie Hurst, who's just... He's, he's racing over the last month or so. It's been amazing. He, he, he won a 700 at Dapto, went back and won a 472-metre free-for-all at Bulleye. Uh, he's, he's in terrific form at the moment, but the dog I really want to see. And we spoke about Miss Esme, will she get 700? Mm. What about Super Estrella? Went one one hundredth outside Segovia's mm. track record at Bulleye over the 590. Mm. Uh, ha, has had a running battle with Sound of Silence for the past four or five, six weeks been intriguing to watch it has its first go over the 700 so i'll ask you that question do you think she can run 700 here we go again here we yeah. go again will she run it out look she ran 35 27 winning at richmond um what last week now that was you know, just under what uh, a cup three tenths out or three tenths outside the track record of space star uh, who it's been a long-standing track record so i think that run under a belt will have her cherry ripe, that 600-metre, hard 600-metre run at Richmond. 
she'll be cherry ripe for the 700 meters. And although it's 729, around that, though, it's a, a, an easier 729, 700 for, for want of a better term, I guess. Uh, yes, I think she'll run it out. She's by Esparza, who we know could you know, certainly run the journey. I think the smaller field will play here to her strengths, and I think she will run it out. And I've got to lean her way to uh, to topple Sound of Silence. But I, I agree, it does look a race in two. And the thing is, I guess, we know Sound of Silence is going to run it out mm. because he's won over the 729. He won over the 717 at uh, Richmond on Friday night. He's drawn inside Super Estrella, and we've seen him jump and run and lead these distance races in the past and that. So I guess, I guess if he's the one doing the work out front, she's sitting on his outside. She's actually working a little bit harder than him. He's close to the fence, obviously not covering as much ground, but the small field, I, I, I can just see them, you know, setting themselves up in that early stage in the run to the first turn from the back straight at Dapto. I, I reckon this is going to be an absolute cracker of a race. I, I think she can win the race mid race by really getting hiking once she balances up. And I think she can pinch a margin min-race on Sound of Silence. I think that's where she can she can win the race. So, uh, as you said, it's an, it's an intriguing race. Only a small field, but it's it's set up for one heck of a battle royale. Don't worry about that with the two favourites. And, you know, even zipping the Nebraska's on, on an upward trend. You know, Blazing Cartier isn't racing as well as uh, she's racing well below um her best, but you know, if she actually found her best form, she she's actually suited by the smallish field, and she could certainly figure. But she would need to lift on recent runs. But yeah, it does look a match race, Jude. All right, we've chewed the fat about a number of things, Timmy. It's now time to actually put us on the spot. I need a dog to follow from you. Uh, look, I've come up with one uh, top quality, uh, two for two, uh, very quick winner at uh, Maitland on debut, then went 22.62 at the Gardens recently. Uh, racing around the Gardens again on uh, Saturday night. Trained, I uh, should, owned by a good friend of mine, Kelly Fogarty, trained by Daryl Thomas. We know Daryl's, uh, he's, a, he's a great trainer. He's got, a, he's got an amazing strike rate. We're talking strike rates earlier. Uh, Daryl's got a tremendous winning strike rate as a trainer. Uh, and I think he's a greyhound on the rise. He's the next litter to line a quality uh, who, who was an out-and-out stayer. But, um, look, he's, he's a high-speed greyhound. And all quality, uh, top quality's mum thro has thrown Le Grand quality, caviar quality. So she's thrown a stack of winners. There's another one in, in, in this litter, um, Barsha quality, who's a very talented type too. But top quality, uh, Duke is my one to follow. Uh, two for two, I think he'll uh, maintain his unbeaten record on Saturday night at the Gardens. What, what have you come up with? I've come up with a dog called Frozen Fire. We've, we've been talking about dams and, and dams that continue to produce and produce. And, and Frozen Fire is, is by Group 1 winner, My Redeemer, but it's out of Tickaway Fire, uh, Mark Maroney's breed. And, and Mark actually trains Frozen Fire as well, but he also trains the likes of Fire Legend, Fire mm -hmm. and Ice, and all of those dogs who are out of uh, Tickaway Fire. Got beaten in his first three starts, this dog. Then went to Gosford last week in a 388 metre race. Or in 22.16 or 22.20, went there on Tuesday night, had box seven, handled himself beautifully, wasn't that flash away. He's in 388 metre races at the moment. His future to me lies over the 500. Um, and I just think he's a dog that we talk about upward trajectories of, you know, greyhounds on the rise. And that I said, he had those first three starts, kicked it off in the graft of Maiden. Uh, didn't have a lot of luck, but his last two runs at Gosford and his run home time on Tuesday night was off the scale. So he's a dog, I think, that's that's going to progress through the grades. And as I said, he's out of Tickaway Fire, like Esparza, like, you know, uh, Solar Pack, like all of those dogs, they just continue to throw good dogs. And in a good kennel with Mark Maroney, he knows... How to, uh, to, how to train a winner, uh, as you mentioned, Fire Legend is going around in the New South, New South Wales Sprint at that day on Thursday night. So, yeah, it's, a, it's a, actually a good litter. I, I do remember uh, back in the Sky Racing days when uh, I went up to Mark's property at Dawson with Disco Dave Carlson, and uh, we did a story on, uh, on Mark. And, yeah, she's been a great producer uh, for him over the years, Tick Away Fire, and he's... He's uh, she she certainly does hold a, a special place in his heart. I know that. 
Trivia fact number 137, Mark Moroni and I grew up together at Hornsby Heights. We lived about 200 metres apart. And when I was training back in the late 70s and Mark was training with his dad, Johnny Moroni, uh, we'd go to tracks like Lithgow and Bathurst and Mudgee and all that. We, we traipsed all around sort of New South Wales. I remember he had a dog called, I think it was Selena Speck, who won a race at Mossvale. The reason she became quite famous she, in, in that sense is that she won a race where they finished in reverse race book order. So I think it's you know sixty four thousand to one or something. Yeah. That's fun trivia fact number one hundred ninety seven that Yogi and I actually grew up together. And you're right, he does do a good job with his team. Uh, Timmy, that wraps up our maiden episode of Behind the Boxes. Uh, if you're listening to us on the podcast, if you're watching us on the vidcast, you can get in touch with us. Send us an email to btb at grnsw.com.au. Please, no dirty emails, no filthy emails. Don't go this out yet. It's only the first episode. Give us a spell. Uh, but if you've got any questions, if you've got any requests, if, you've, if you'd like us to, you know, say maybe interview someone that you really want to hear from, send us an email to btb at grnsw.com.au. Pleasure as always to have you on the show, mate. Pleasure as always to be talking dogs. We are love nothing better than doing that with you, Battler. It's been good, Duke. We haven't done it for a while, and uh, oh. it's good that the old team is back together, which is great. And any single ladies out there, if you're looking for a, a partner, shoot shoot an email in. I think exactly. you're at the moment, moment, aren't you, Duke? I'm taken, ladies. I'm taken. But yeah. Duke, we know he's a single man, so just shoot it an email. You might get a date when when we're, everything's back open again. Hey, right, thanks for thanks for the leg up. Literally, <laughs> yeah. All right, I will speak to you next week and to our listeners and our viewers. I hope you've enjoyed our first coverage, our first episode, I should say, of Behind the Boxes. We'll catch you next week.